I think the only thing that's left for me is then to introduce uh, Jeremy. Um, as I'm sure you were all aware, he is the Welsh Government's Council General and Minister for European Transition. Jeremy was uh, educated at a uh, school Stalavera and then in Oxford before, before becoming a teacher of law at the University of Warsaw in Poland. He was first elected to the Welsh Parliament, the Senedd, in May 2016 as the member for Neath. He served as the Council General since 2017, as Brexit Minister and then European Transition Minister since 2018. And he's also been designated as the Welsh Government's lead on planning for post-COVID recovery. So Jeremy is a very busy man. And of course, in practical terms, as you're all aware, he is, in effect, the Welsh Government's leading voice on constitutional affairs. The title, as you've all seen, is Why Wales Must Resist the Westminster Power Grab and How to Do It. And with no further ado, I will hand you over to Jeremy Miles. Croeso cynas iawn, a diolch. Well, diolch, Richard, am y gwahoddiad ac am y croeso. Can I thank the Wales Government Centre for the opportunity to speak and wish everyone all the best for the year. I, I hope and expect it'll be a better year uh, for all of us. Um, of course, New Year's Eve uh, saw not just the turn of the year, but the end of one era and the beginning of a new one. And we're now unequivocally outside the EU's legal and regulatory system, which of course has been the context uh, in which devolution and all recent constitutional reform in the UK has been forged. And it's the implications of that that I want to discuss uh, today. Because you know, if the two-stroke engine of the UK's version of multi-level governance was misfiring before the referendum, I think the um, pretty tortuous uphill crawl uh, of the Brexit process has finally rendered it uh, fit only for the scrap heap. Uh, little, I think, if any, of the discussion during the 2016 campaign itself focused on the implications for the future of the UK, with some uh, valiant exceptions from former Prime Ministers uh, John Major and Tony Blair in the context of Northern Ireland. But then we had a shock result and then the differing verdicts across the UK. Um, I think the strain that Brexit would come to put on the devolved settlements rapidly became clear to all of us. Uh, the form of devolution, of course, introduced uh, uh, across the UK from the 1990s onwards was absolutely predicated uh, on membership of the EU. In most uh, federal states, uh, Canada and Australia, for example, agriculture, say, is a competence of the federal government, given how important it is for international trade, um, and also from, from a level playing field perspective. But in the UK, it was one of the first competences to be devolved because the common agricultural policy provided that common framework within which the kind of detailed design of policy could then be decentralised. But I think within the first few months of the referendum, it became clear that in the sort of new post-EU landscape, we would need at the very least to reinvent our system of devolution on the basis of shared governance. And what I mean by that is governments working with each other in a complementary fashion within their respective competence. I don't mean one government extending its own powers into areas which are already the responsibility of the other. Um, and I'm proud that the Welsh Government actually was the first, I think, to spell out how a system of common free frameworks, freely agreed by four governments, uh, would be needed after departure. And the aim in that was to reconcile the freedoms of the institutions in each of the four nations to regulate within their competence with safeguards to prevent either a downward spiral of deregulation or unintended damage to uh, the UK's competi competitiveness. And I think progress on the frameworks obviously has been slower than we had hoped, but it's still impressive. But under Boris Johnson's prime ministership, it's become very evident that the UK government's commitment to the process is lukewarm uh, at best. But it isn't just commitment to frameworks which has been lukewarm. Uh, like me, uh, the UK government clearly believes that the current system of devolution uh, isn't working, but their solution is not to reimagine it, but to try to crush it 
And it seems that taking back control was also about re-centralising control in Westminster and in Whitehall. And this process, I would suggest, is being pursued with a very clear purpose and pretty ruthless execution. Um, and it's most recently glaringly apparent in the UK uh, uh, Internal Market Act, which uh, the Johnson administration is essentially using to smash through pretty fragile defences of devolved competence. There was a pretty tokenistic consultation on the bill and the results of it were not uh, on the white paper and the results of it were never uh, properly published. Uh, and despite, I would say, a pretty heroic effort by the House of Lords to make the UK government think again, it essentially used its Commons majority to push through a bill which represents a fundamental challenge uh, to the Senate, the Scottish Parliament and the Northern Ireland Assembly, whilst at the same time uh, claiming that the bill in fact increased, not diminished, the powers of devolved institutions. Uh, that's a claim which hasn't been backed by any independent commentators or academics and is you know, demonstrably not true. Um, so I want to talk about the attack on legislative competence, uh, which is the focus of the legal action which uh, we launched this week. But, uh, but first, just want to draw your attention to the other most dangerous part of the act, which is uh, the so-called financial assistance powers. Uh, and again, during the bill's passage, the government claimed that these were necessary not to undermine the devolution, but again, to complement it. Um, but in the few short weeks since it was enacted, we've seen uh, that with a so-called shared prosperity fund, UK government, rather than seeking to work with the devolved governments, has clearly been intending to work around us using those powers in the act, uh, essentially to run a beauty contest, uh, which I suspect will show a pretty close correlation with conservative target seats in the forthcoming elections. But we also know the UK government wants to use the powers in the act to enable it to implement uh, its successor to Erasmus, the Turing programme, which of course is no substitute at all in reality. Uh, another case of UK ministers wanting to use powers to bypass devolved governments, deploying resources which you know, should have been divided between the four governments to fund uh, an initiative in a purely devolved policy area which uh, neither the Welsh Government nor the Scottish Government, for example, thinks uh, is appropriate. Um, but let me turn to the most compelling reason why we have a fight on our hands to defend uh, the rights of the Senate from a Westminster and Whitehall power grab. Um, the fundamental threat that the UK Internal Market Act poses to the primary purpose of devolution, to enable democratically accountable institutions in Wales, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland to reflect the values and priorities and concerns of uh, people they represent. It's effectively uh, a constitutional overhaul masquerading as market regulation. Um, and in our efforts to get the bill amended uh, in the House of Lords, we used the example of the single use plastics directive. This is in part so it's very telling really because it gives the lie i would suggest to the claim by the uk government that they were only trying to mirror restrictions uh on the freedoms of devolved governments and institutions that came from a membership of the eu uh, but transposition of the directive is only required by july of this year so won't apply to the uk um, but it did provide for member states in the eu to ban the sale of nine uh, commonly littered single-use plastic products, things like cotton bud sticks and polystyrene cups and so on. Um, and rather than transpose that directive into UK law in respect of England, what the UK government wants to do for England, so to speak, is to ban only three of the nine, uh, of, of the nine products. Now, the Welsh government, which is consistent with our recognition of the scale of uh, the climate emergency and the threat to biodiversity, uh, we've been consulting on a proposal to ban all nine types. Uh, but the Act, if it applied as the Conservative government would want it to be applied, would effectively make that impossible. Um, it, it certainly renders a ban on the sale of those kinds of items inoperable, but it also risks going further by curtailing the capacity even to legislate uh, in a way which is inconsistent with the Act, given its status as a protected enactment. Um, and as long as the six types of single-use plastic products continue to be allowed, for example, on the market in England, it would be unlawful to prevent the sale in Wales uh, of those items, and also uh, unlawful for the Senate to legislate in certain other ways 
uh, around the labeling or packaging of that sort of product. So while the Act doesn't expressly cut back the powers granted to the Senate and the Welsh Government, at least in this area, uh, it fatally undermines them to the extent that we argue that the Act effectively repeals parts of the Government of Wales Act. And that, in essence, uh, is the first part of the case which we started this week in the Administrative Court. Uh, and it's based on the well-established uh, legal principle that uh, constitutional statutes cannot be impliedly repealed. Uh, of course, one of the many failings in our current uh, constitution is the uh, outdated political notion of the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament. Um, and incidentally, I commend, I commend the former First Minister's article this week for the UK, for the UK um, Constitutional Law Association, which very carefully dismantles that piece of uh, tarnished Victoriana. Um, but the principle, of course, means that Parliament can legislate to take away the powers of the Senev, but if it wishes to do so, it needs to do so explicitly. Indeed, it did that in the case of state aid uh, in this Act, uh, but the government in Westminster chose not to do it in relation to the market access principles, presumably because it recognised that this would then reveal the truth of what it was seeking to achieve in the legislation. Uh, the second ground for our submission to the court is that the scope of the so-called Henry VIII powers in the bill, which are uh, the powers by which ministers can amend primary legislation through secondary legislation, uh, that those powers are so broad as again uh, to open the way to UK ministers actually removing the powers of the Senev. One of the main objections to the Act was that the exceptions to the market access principles, the approach that any product which could be legally sold in one part of the UK must not be prevented from being sold in the rest of it, that the exceptions to those principles are far, far narrower in the Act than is the case under EU law. But the Act also gives UK ministers the power to restrict them even further by, uh, by statutory inst instrument. So, for example, they could decide to remove the fact that a food was unsafe as being a justification for the Senate to ban a product from sale in Wales if it was approved elsewhere in the UK. Now, the case for resisting the power grab would, in my view, be unanswerable, even if we were faced by a government whose protestations of commitments to high standards of environmental protection, labour market rights and so on could be uh, could be believed. Um, but we've already seen, haven't we, in, in the last few weeks, uh, really clear evidence uh, that UK ministers are looking at ways to roll back some of the protections derived from the EU, you know, whether it's neonicotinoids, whether it's around um, gene editing in crops and animals, whether uh, the consultation on scrapping working time limits. There are plenty uh, of examples already, even in the three weeks since we left the transition period. So all this shows that there's a real and present danger that Wales and Scotland will face a situation where the UK government cuts standards and uses the pressure of the UK Internal Market Act uh, to ensure that Wales and Scotland follow suit. So I think it's clear why you need to stop the Westminster power grab which is underway, but how do we do it? Um, I've outlined the strategy which we deployed on the Internal Market Act, amend, reject consent, challenge in court. Um, and in addition to this, of course, the UK government is going to face a number of delivery obstacles to the use of their financial assistance powers in Wales, which is obviously a challenge ultimately for them to solve. It certainly won't be a challenge for the Welsh government to solve if they've chosen to circumvent the devolution settlement. But the broader response to this strategic assault uh, on the powers we have in Wales is to mobilise support, not simply for defending these powers, but for enhancing them. Uh, and the solution is clearly to use our energy to do all that we can to bring about a fundamental change in the governance of the whole UK. There are increasingly few defenders uh, of the status quo. That is a good thing, and the Welsh Government certainly isn't among them. There is no case for the status quo. But the debate is sometimes characterised uh, as being a future where there's a binary choice, if you like, between independence and how to save the Union. But the question, I think, isn't how to save the Union, as though that were an end in itself, 
Uh, the question is to make a case for a reformed union as an essential component for the future well-being of Wales. So the question really is, what sort of future do we want? And why is the union necessary to deliver that? And that is a different question. I and my party believe that our twin commitments to self-determination and mutual support uh, are best realised in a reformed union capable of giving full voice to national sentiment and also to the sort of burden sharing we feel is the hallmark of a just society. The Varnet formula plainly has more than had its day and any new constitutional settlement is going to have to be based uh, on an enforceable fiscal um, financial framework which puts fiscal equalisation uh, at its heart. But there is nevertheless a strong case for pooling financial resources, not because Wales will always need support. After all, at points in the last 200 years, it's actually been one of the most prosperous parts of the UK. But because in an uncertain world, as we know in, our, in the context of our relationship with the European Union, it makes sense to pool our risk. And turning our backs on the rest of the UK may be tempting, but it's also in a very real sense a failure of governance. Our approach as a government has been not to not conceal uh, from the people of Wales, you know, the hard choices, the dilemmas, the very significant difficulties sometimes of operating in our unreformed union. We've been very candid, I would suggest, about that. But equally, independence also involves choices that people will not easily want to make any more than we wish to make some of the choices that we are called upon to make uh, within the current version of the union. And I think the fact that that remark may be heard perhaps by some as evidence of a lack of ambition, um, I suggest is itself evidence of how far the debate uh, has yet to go about uh, our future. What is certain though is that devolution in, a set, in the sense of a set of bilateral relationships predicated on the untrammeled sovereignty uh, of the Westminster Parliament is no longer sufficient or stable enough either to reflect the differences between the nations nor to withstand the sustained attack of a UK government which is hostile to it. But there is a radical uh, alternative to the current union one which we've already begun to describe in, in our document, Reforming uh, Our Union, uh, which is based on federalist principles, or the sort of radical federalism we've heard talk, talked about, including uh, most recently uh, at the We The People initiative launched last week. But a sort of union which distributes rather than hoards power and then builds on uh, both the sense of identity, but also the dynamism and distinctiveness uh, in Wales and Scotland, but also crucially, uh, in England as well. Of course, these are fine words and I acknowledge that. What do we actually do about it? Uh, well, for a start, we need to use all the tools at our disposal to challenge uh, and frustrate the sort of reactionary uh, uh, Westminster approach that doesn't represent our people, which we see uh, in, uh, reflected in the current UK uh, government. That's why we've worked so hard on a truly cross-party basis, actually, to get the Internal Market Bill amended by the Lords, with some actually some significant success, although you know too little in the end. Um, that's why we're challenging, challenging it in the courts now that it's been enacted, and why, if we succeed, uh, and if the UK government seek to reintroduce even more sweeping legislation, we will do all that we can again to mobilise against that, uh, and that will be an even more visible threat, I think. But we also have to work to produce a vision of uh, an alternative and to recognise that this will not be, not be achieved uh, overnight. The campaign for a Scottish Assembly uh, was launched obviously after the failure of the referendum in 1979 uh, and 20 years before the devolution, before devolution was achieved. Uh, its successor, the Scottish Constitutional Convention, was established in 1989. So I think, you know, achieving a new constitution for the UK will be at least as hard. We, as a Welsh Government, have obviously called uh, for, for a long time uh, for a constitutional convention. And so I'm welcoming the Labour Party's commitment to them. Um, uh, it's essential, we think, that it needs to be an inclusive and a cross-party effort, fundamentally rooted in civic uh, and civil society. And I think, you know, I recognise that there is a body of thought that sort of derides that as a sort of uh, fudgy alternative to uh, 
the apparent simplicity and certainty uh, of uh, the alternative of independence. But I, I think that is seriously to overestimate the extent to which uh, the Welsh public will simply embrace the undoubted you know, emotional appeal of that prospect without getting answers to some very uncomfortable questions. Uh, and the reality is that we've just spent five years trying to withdraw from a 40-year-old union with great trauma. And I think we will find uh, a, a huge cost to those who can bear it the least. Uh, but that would be as nothing compared to the impact of withdrawing from a 600-year-old union. And that isn't a lack of optimism on my, on my part. I think it's just you know, an honest reflection, really. So it's not possible to yet know whether and how a convention-based approach will lead to the sort of progressive change that we need. But we should look in Wales, I think, to the model of the Scottish Convention, which did prepare the ground uh, and provided the model uh, for reform. And I think it's essential uh, that when a different government comes to power in Westminster, that there is already a set of widely supported proposals for reform to hand. And let me say here that I do recognise the extent to which uh, our ability to sustain that argument depends vitally on my party's ability in Westminster to bring forward a radical programme of reform and to win power uh, at the next uh, UK general election. But what, uh, finally, uh, of the situation in which what uh, David Melding calls only the most accomplished statecraft, statecraft uh, fails to prevent Scotland exercising its clear right to move towards independence. What uh, of that situation? Well, if that becomes a reality, we in Wales then must be prepared for a fundamental renegotiation of the relationship between Wales uh, and England, which will lay the basis, I think, for a profound choice for our people between three alternatives. Uh, a rerun effectively of the 1536 Act of Union, participation on the basis of true equality in a federal UK, or a future which we despair of reform and choose the path of independence, which I think may look attractive enough to begin with, but which we know from the experience of the last five years is very likely to become narrower, steeper, and somewhat harder to navigate the longer you go on. Thank you very much. Yeah, hello, Ryan, Jeremy. Um, we've got uh, a lot of questions already, so can I just um, just remind everybody who is um, who is watching that there is a question and answer box down below at the bottom of the page. I guess underneath me somewhere. Um, if you write the question in there, and I will do my best to to pick them up. We've got a lot of questions. Let me start with a question. Some some people put names down there. I've no idea if they're real names, but a Steve Thomas asks, you have issued formal proceedings in the administrative court seeking permission for a judicial review. Question, what if the grounds of claim are denied or if the review goes forward and is lost? What is the Welsh Government's plan B, since clearly this massively undermines the existing settlement? Well, um, we aren't in a position where we're contemplating a plan B at this stage, having you know, just announced, uh, having just launched the proceedings. But Steve is right. Obviously, there are um, a, a number of you know, hurdles along the path. We think that we have a good argument. The principles that we're basing it on are you know, well established. The principle of legality, the principle that you can't imply it, you repeal the statute. Uh, and, you know, I think um, whilst it isn't common to challenge Acts of Parliament, it certainly happens. So, you know, we certainly accept it's a novel approach, but we think we've got a good uh, set of arguments. Uh, actually, um, in the passage of the bill through Parliament uh, and in correspondence with us as ministers, there are many, many examples of um, UK government ministers saying in the, cha in the two chambers that the intention in the bill is not to uh, cut back uh, the devolution settlement. So in a sense, what these proceedings you know, are effectively about is to make that political intention a matter of law. And so in that sense, you would hope that the UK government would agree with that. Um, but as I say, as I, I think I outlined the speech, um, you know, we will do everything we can in relation to this bill. Um, if we uh, fail, then obviously, you know, as I say, there's a broader political approach which we've been uh, articulating and which we'll continue to fight for. Hello, Jeremy. I have a question from uh, 
Ben Goddard, which I think is a very uh, helpful one. Um, ben writes, to be devil's advocates, why are the UK, you, why, I do apologise, why are the EU's market principles okay, uh, whereas the UK uses them, it's an attack on devolution? Well, um, the two uh, principles which I think are important here are about, you know, respecting the devolution settlement uh, and operating within a framework of standards. So, you know, within the European Union, there were a set of principles which essentially provides a framework to the sorts of things we're talking about uh, today. Um, and those principles were essentially, you know, agreed between uh, member states. Um, there's a democratic process, but essentially, you know, there's a voice for each member state in that process. Um, and in fact, what we wanted as a government was to amend the bill to effectively put that principle at the heart of the legislation, um, because we think it's an important principle. It was an important principle as members of the European Union, and it's obviously still an important principle. So what we sought to do as a government, and we published, you know, amendments for the for, for, to deliver this, if you like. Uh, we worked with the U, we, you know, we worked with the UK government to try and persuade them of the virtues of this once the bill had been published, and we worked with the Lords with some success, to be fair. Um, but what we wanted to do was put that idea of agreement at the heart of the bill, so that we would do everything we can as four governments to agree uh, an approach in relation to matters which were devolved, uh, accepting that there would obviously be differences between the four governments as there have been for the last 20 years, and they've been managed perfectly, perfectly sensibly. Um, you know, and then if that agreement failed, then we recognised, we as a government recognised that the kind of constitutional backstop in our constitution in the UK is Parliament, we acknowledge that. But that, that approach, you know, wasn't, wasn't accepted effectively. So that's why the principles are different, because one is based on an agreed approach, and one effectively, as this legislation was, was essentially imposed. Um, and we don't think that uh, reflects the devolved principles of the UK constitution, really. And the other point I was making, uh, Ben, is around the floor of standards, uh, which obviously exists within the European Union, and this bill does not provide. Um, so there is no basic uh, floor, which we think is vital for the operation of this kind of internal market, really. But where one set of standards simply diverges in one part of the UK, then that effectively becomes the benchmark against which sale of goods in all parts of the UK becomes measured. So that's very different from um, life within the European Union. Jeff Jeremy, uh, I have a, a, an anonymous uh, question here. It's, it's techie, but if you can't ask a techie question in a Wales Governance Centre event, then where can you ask a techie question? The question is, what's the future of the common frameworks uh, now that the UK Internal Market Act is enacted? Well, um, what, one of the things we did succeed in getting was a recognition in the act of the existence of the common frameworks uh, process. So not in the way that I've just described it, not in the way which means the common, frame, common frameworks process is the starting point, but there is a recognition in the legislation of the existence of it. Um, and the Lords, uh, you know, with our support really, were able to amend it so that um, where there is a common framework in, in agreement, there is a mechanism for, you know, from taking that outside the market access principles, which I was talking about. But that ultimately is a matter of discretion for the Secretary of State. Uh, which we obviously have an objection to. Um, but, you know, so, that, so it's in the Act in terms of recognising the principle. What's happening on the ground in relation to that is um, we've put in place by the end of the transition period a set of interim framework agreements, basically, across the range of areas which uh, cover, you know, pretty much the entirety of the internal market. The start of this process, you might remember, was a list by the UK government of the kinds of frameworks that would be needed to cover an internal market. So, we, you know, we took that as a starting point. Um, so over the course of the next year, those will be, you know, observed in a sort of interim way, if you like, between the governments. Um, but there's no job of work to do, firstly, for them to be scrutinised by the legislatures. And secondly, for them to be, you know, looked at now afresh, because we've got the Northern Ireland Protocol, we've got uh, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, We've got the uh, Future Relationship Act. Um, you know, there are the Internal Market Act, obviously. So we've got you know four substantial new um, pieces of architecture, which now need to be you know looked. So the frameworks need to be looked at against the lens of each of those. So that's a very substantial piece of work. Uh, but there is a commitment from the four governments to do that. As I say, um, 
you know, the commitment which we had under the previous administration from the UK uh, government, I, I think was much more proactive. But I also just want to acknowledge that part of the reason for the delay over the course of the last year, as well as the general elections, was of course the COVID implicate the COVID pandemic. So, you know, we as a government remain committed to this process uh, and we want to see them being pursued, you know, with pace uh, throughout the rest of this year so that we have frameworks in place. Uh, that's, you know, operating by agreement and negotiating kind of the way we work together as four governments remains a much better way of proceeding than the sort of uh, blunderbuss which this act represents. Can I shift then, uh shift our, our lens to, to the Labour Party. There's, a, there's another anonymous question here, uh, which I think is very interesting and, and timely. Is the dialogue between Welsh, Scottish and UK Labour on constitutional reform and the intendant policies happening to a sufficient degree? It is notable that Monica Lennon, MSP, uh, who is obviously one of the candidates for the Scottish Labour leadership now that uh, Richard Leonard has resigned, is calling for a split within UK Labour. I, I guess I could add to that to say that when uh, Sir Keir Starmer made his big speech on the Union of the other day and, and talked about Gordon Brown's leading role, it was quite notable from at least where I was sitting that the Welsh Government's extensive work uh, and the document that you mentioned reshaping the Union front and centre, that wasn't really mentioned. So, so the question about how Labour as a party is approaching all of this and is it joined up I guess is, is the question. Well I think there are two things to this really uh, and it's important I think to set these various things in com in the context. So uh, Keir Starmer's speech is a sort of you know a starting point for a way of thinking and I think the key thing for me for that I think I should say to start with it was very much focused uh, on devolution and the devolution landscape in Scotland which I think explains uh, Richard why you know the reforming the union piece of work wasn't sort of front and center of it because it was very much you know a response to the situation in Scotland I think um, but I think it was a you know a, the, the, the part of it which I um, took most um, heart from was the uh, commitment to a, a convention uh, and as I said in my speech just now I you know I obviously recognize that that is uh, challenged by some but I myself think that is the realistic way of achieving the kind of broad base of support and consensus that uh, is needed um, but that's the other, you know, that's the other part of the question, really, in a sense. Um, how do you take that forward? Uh, how do you make sure that the different voices of different parts of the party and different governments, um, or government in Wales rather, is, is, is reflected in that? I think you saw the beginning of, you know, that kind of public dialogue in a way, as well as what's dis being discussed behind the scenes within the party in the intervention from last week, which is um, uh, the, uh, the group, the We the People group. And again, you know, that, that really is an, is an intervention in a party debate about, you know, describing what we are, you know, very comfortable talking about in Wales in terms of a kind of federalist model and so on. But, you know, bluntly with a recognition that that isn't a kind of conversation which is as mature in all parts of the UK. I mean, that's, in a sense, self-evident. And the extent to which, you know, my party's a UK-wide party, obviously, in a sense, it will reflect that. Um, so I think... Uh, you know, there is, a, there is a, um, obviously a, an ongoing dialogue within the party. I myself think that it's incumbent on us to bring forward at a UK-wide level, you know, the most ambitious uh, programme of reform, really, and to be able to persuade people to elect the Labour government in Westminster to de deliver that at the next general election. I think achieving that is a pretty fundamental uh, next step for the sort of worldview that I'm describing in the, in the remarks uh, earlier. Um, and I think, you know, We've done a lot of thinking as a Welsh government, clearly in the context of constitutional reform more broadly, but also specifically in Brexit. And I want to see, and I'm confident I will see, that given full voice uh, in the kind of product of our party discussions across the UK. Jeremy, uh, slightly uh, change change attack again. So, sorry, the, we, with the questions, uh, as I as I, uh, I just urge you to put questions in the Q&A box. Um, they, they cover a broad range. So we're jumping fr from hither to thither. There's a question here from Eileen McCagg um, up in Glasgow, if I'm not mistaken. You have named the Lord Advocate and the Attorney uh, General for Northern Ireland as interested parties in your challenge. Do you expect the Scottish Government and Northern Ireland Executive to support your arguments in the same way as all three devolved governments work together in the Continuity Bill reference? 
Oh, well, there are two points, there are two parts to the answer to that question, Aileen, and um, thanks for it. Firstly, as you will know, but as others may not, um, those uh, references on the face of the case are, in effect, technical references. They don't indicate that those two parties are, you know, as it were, party to the case, um, but they are clearly interested in the outcomes of it for obvious reasons. And so it's, you know, the convention and the requirement, I think, is to state that in the, in the case, that's the legal technical bit. Um, uh, in terms of support, you've seen the statements from the Scottish Government already, um, which um, are, you know, very supportive, clearly. I think the situation in Northern Ireland is somewhat different because of the, the way the executive is set up, but certainly in the past, you know, the middle of litigation and other contexts, we've worked as a three devolved government, three devolved law officers, in, in, in legal challenges. Um, but I think the reality of what will happen is, uh, you know, we will see what happens to the um, uh, application for uh, leave for judicial review. Uh, and if, as I hope and I expect, uh, if I may say, that is granted, then I think at that point there'll be a sort of more practical discussion about, uh, you know, other governments and so on. Um, but but, but we, were, we were very keen to make progress rapidly because it seemed to us that um, you know, the bill is already obviously uh, in force, the act is in force, and so the damage it's doing is current. I have a question from um, Matthew Kidwell. Thank you, Matthew. Um, you have identified the unequal constitutional status of a sovereign Westminster Parliament and subordinate Welsh and Scottish Parliaments as being a fundamental defect in the current settlement. How, how realistic is the prospect of the Westminster Parliament giving up its sovereign status? And just to, to add to that, somebody else who I won't try and search through the questions now makes the point that it would appear that most Labour MPs seem to support the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament. So how, realis how realistic is changing that? Well, I mean, the point I was making earlier was that I recognise that persuading you know, in a sense, persuading Parliament of a different approach is essential to the kind of, you know, the direction of travel I've talked about in my speech. Uh, you know, whether Parliament will will be inclined to support that plainly depends on the composition of Parliament. Um, and so, what I would say is the two aspects, whatever, whatever, um, whatever the constitutional architecture ultimately ends up looking like. And I say that because there are obviously a range of different ways in which you could undertake reform from federalism, home rule, Devo Max, you know, there are, there are obviously lots of different approaches. The two aspects which I think are, you know, ultimately indispensable to any sustainable uh, reform are, are firstly uh, the notion of a, of a constitutionally constrained parliament in Westminster, if you like. Uh, and secondly, uh, the uh, an, an enforceable mechanism for fiscal transfer. Um, and I think, you know, those two are the kind of, you know, knotty questions in any of these discussions, it seems to me, and I'm going to reasonably keep to kind of look at them head on. Uh, so the question then I asked myself is how do you persuade, I mean, clearly from the kind of uh, perspective of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, there is a, I would suggest, a compelling case for both those principles. How do you persuade um, England, as it were, for which the case might not be so immediately compelling, but that is, um, you know, prospectus that, they, that parts of England or England as a nation should sign up to. Uh, and I'm very mindful of the work that Richard and uh, Jacqueline have done around, you know, cautioning us, as it were, to not seek to draw easy parallels between the experience of devolution in Wales and the equivalent possibility of that in, uh, on a regional level in England. So really mindful of that, and I think that's absolutely an important cautionary note. But I do think the level of inequality, with the regional inequality between uh, parts of England, is becoming starker, you know, if it needed to be, by by the week, really. And we've seen that perhaps most vividly in the in the COVID context of the recent months. And I think there is a persuasive case which can be made, as it were, to England, uh, that there are benefits of having a Parliament, which are both constrained constitutionally, but bluntly protected constitutionally uh, against uh, the operations of a government whose commitment to parliamentary uh, scrutiny uh, aren't always what they should be, on the, on the one hand. And I certainly think that there's a persuasive case to be made about an enforceable fiscal transfer to 
you know, benefit parts of England, which frankly are significantly disbenefited by the current arrangements. So I do think, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that there is a case to be made, but uh, that's to go back to the point I made earlier about the nature of a, con of a convention. That's why, in a sense, if you want to achieve that kind of parliamentary reform, you know, that can only be done on the basis of a UK-wide um, convention, you know, influenced by the different uh, nations as we want it to be. Uh, Bjorkan, and thank you for your kind words about the recent publication by Jack Lamb and myself. It's uh, out now in the IPPR Progressive Re Review. There's also a book coming out um, by Ilsa Henderson and myself about Englishness in the next few weeks. Um, and I can see a couple of questions about that, so I'm, we may return. There's a question here, however, from uh, Gethin Rhys, Bjork Gethin, um, which, which kind of combines some of your current roles, uh, Jeremy. Do you think that one reason for the power grab is that the UK government has been surprised and alarmed by the extent of devolution displayed in the COVID crisis? E.g., uh, well, actually, that's the question, basically. Do you think that part of this is, is that there's been a kind of a rude awakening to the reality of devolution? Um, well, um, there's the question of cause and correlation here, isn't there, really? So myself, I don't think it's caused by that because the evidence of it was there before COVID started. So, you know, the development of the internal market bill at the very start of it, um, uh, certainly at the end of the year before last, was, you know, a sort of open set of discussions about how this might look. At the time, it wasn't anything approaching the way it did end up looking. So that's why a more open discussion was possible, presumably. Um, and it was a very different thing that was being considered at that point, really. Um, so that, but that had dried up before, I think, the uh, COVID experience came to pass. And it is certainly the case that there was a very marked shift uh, between, you know, in the transition from the May government to the Johnson government in the UK government's approach to um, to devolution generally. You know, what you, you will have heard me say in previous settings, and other ministers and the first minister say in particular, you know, it, it was certainly not, you know, very um, positive, but you could absolutely see that there were, very, you know, attempts under the May premiership to try and make the relationships work uh, as best they could. Um, there, there certainly isn't the same commitment remotely uh, in this government in Westminster. So, so I don't actually think it's caused by that. But I dare say that the process of um, working, you know, as four governments during COVID, well, it certainly um, exposed the weaknesses in the system, in, in the intergovernmental system. Um, and I think whereas at the start it was very, uh, you know, when the, when the emergency was most immediate and most keenly uh, developing, there was very close working. Um, but, you know, as soon as the different approaches of the four governments emerged about stay at home, um, I can't quite remember what the UK government's slogan was at that point. Um, you know, clearly there was a divergence after that. But, you know, it's still the case that we are doing everything we can to try and work on a four nations basis, certainly as a government in Wales, around COVID. Yeah, um, I, I feel we're really putting you through the mill here. There's nowhere to hide in these kinds of Zoom sessions. I'm, I'm bombarding you. Can I just make a note to the, um, I think stay alert may have been the, the slogan. Um, Thank you. Um, some of you are putting comments in the chats. I can't physically look in the chats and in the question and answers at the same time. So if you want to attract my attention, um, please continue using the Q&A. We have a question here, which is a very uh, interesting one, I think. Um, from uh, our old friend, Professor now, Emir Lewis, uh, uh, relating to some of your comments about the future of the UK and your desired future. Moving away from parliamentary supremacy will mean the need for some other kind of anchor for the UK's constitutional arrangements. What would that be and how would you secure its legitimacy across all four nations? Um, well, I mean, you know, I suppose the uh, conventional response to that is uh, some sort of written constitution, really, isn't it? But uh, which accepts that there are constraints uh, on Parliament. Uh, but, you know, in a sense, we have uh, parts of our constitution currently obviously written. Um, uh, we've just been talking about the devolution settlement today, haven't we? Well, that, obviously, that's fundamental constitutional legislation. And there are some, you know, 
so obviously I don't need to say, tell you, Emmett, but for others on the call, you know, there are some conventions which protect devolution, uh, which protect constitutional set, set, uh, legislation. One of them is the one that we are pleading in this case. So in a sense, there's an existing body of um, legislation. You know, the Dominion Acts back in the 30s effectively were a transfer of sovereignty. Now, in, you know, in, in the kind of, in the sort of, um, you know, very purist uh, parliamentary sovereignty world, then they're capable of being repealed, aren't they? But, you know, it's inconceivable they would be. Uh, and so there are different ways of doing this, I think. You know, as I say, the written constitution is the obvious one uh, and the most, I suppose, systematic. Um, but it isn't a solution to all these challenges, obviously. Um, and I think that sort of um, that sort of reform would require some sort of UK-wide referendum, I guess, to to, um, to enshrine its legitimacy. Um, but I think my my own view is that the the, the first task, you know, I suppose, it's a political task, really, not principally a legal task. But the first task is, you know, securing the acceptance of that idea of the constraint on Parliament. Um, as a principle, really. Um, and I, I think uh, Cameron Jones' article in this week's, or last week's perhaps at this point, uh, UK Constant Constitutional Law Association uh, publication, uh, you know, makes a very elegant case for, for why we shouldn't feel, um, uh, we shouldn't feel constrained by what is essentially an English concept of parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, a slight change of tack again. Um, this is a question uh, from Neil Schofield Hughes, the Neil. Um, the deal agreed in December is made between the UK and the EU. It doesn't recognise the Bal nations um, of the UK. How? And this is the question: How much scope is there for the Welsh government to work bilaterally with the EU? Erasmus being a case in point. Obviously, as somebody who's working in a university, this is a very, very live issue for lots of us. So that's why I'm going to ask that question. Okay, well, I mean, there, there is some recognition actually, un unusually, in the trade and cooperation agreement of at least the existence of devolved governments, but mainly in the context of imposing uh, new obligations on devolved governments to um, make sure that we uh, publish, I think, on an annual basis from memory, a kind of program of, of reform in the coming year. So that, that could be the basis of, you know, analysis, if you like, for the well functioning of the relationship. Um, but it doesn't, you know, there isn't, just to probably directly answer your question, there isn't um, um, any commitment in the governance architecture um, for there to be a role for devolved governments, but certainly that is one of our um, areas that we, we are discussing, we'll want to discuss further, obviously, with the UK government to make sure that we have uh, a voice directly in those uh, discussions where they deal with devolved matters in the way that we obviously have had through the Council of Ministers relationship um, when the UK was a member state. Um, and that is separate, although complemented by the kind of intergovernmental review work that's already uh, going on. But it is a direct um, relationship. I mean, I think the practical reality for that is uh, that um, uh, those things will ultimately need to be mediated through the UK government in terms of, you know, um, discussions of the sort of practical things around Erasmus and so on that we are about to say a few things on. Um, but, but you know we've always had um, a relationship both with other member states, uh, with the Commission, but done in a way which is completely mindful of uh, the UK government's um, status as, as the member state. Obviously since the UK government has chosen no longer to be the member state, I, I expect that gives us a bit more uh, latitude. But I, I, I also want to be conscious of the fact that there are difficult questions in this space for the Commission itself and for the EU itself, and obviously we need to be kind of realistic and mindful about all of that. Um, on the Erasmus specific uh, front, I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it is one of the more scandalous things, I think, that um, uh, the UK government chose not to pursue uh, participation in Erasmus Plus, uh, which is a much, you know, even better scheme, if you like, than, than its predecessor. Um, Erasmus. So um, I think that's a very, very significant uh, failing, actually, and it's, I think, completely irresponsible. Um, um, but uh, what we are doing as a government in that context is looking at what other options we've got. Um, I have discussed this with uh, uh, Michael Gove, and I have had a response to my request for certain information. So we're looking at that to see what flexibilities we may have as a government about direct 
participation and also domestic alternatives clearly um, uh, but I honestly don't think that will be straightforward um, uh, so you know I think that's where we are at the moment we're trying to work through what those options might look like see to understand what's realistic and what isn't yeah we're just reaching the kind of final uh, straight here I have a question well more than one question but I'm going to ask one of them by, from Jack Solis and I guess the, the question is, would you support a federal model for a prospective new UK constitution then? Uh, and, I, and I think that what's maybe important here is that it's not a kind of qualified, it's a federal model proper with presumably equal powers for the uh, different units or, or presumably if not, then you're still, you've still got the issue of what you do about English or England as a whole if you're not doing full legislative devolution for whatever units you go for in England. So where do you stand on that issue of, uh, if, if you do have a position on that? Yeah, I'm, I myself would support that, but I just, but I do want to say in the way that Jack's question assumes, you know, there are some practical challenges in applying kind of pure model of there. And you've just listed some of them, uh, Richard. And that's why the way I myself am less sort of theological about the precise um, mechanisms, although I would support a federal model if that were capable of being achieved in, in the way that, you know, England would be a, its whole constituent part, as it were. Um, that feels to me to be a, a bit of a challenge in, in that way, but, you know, I would support it if it were possible. Um, but I think there are some prior questions, really, which need to be, you know, pursued politically. Um, and, and I've listed a couple of them, what, you know, what the role is of England in that, as it were. Um, and those two questions about constraint on Parliament and that kind of fiscal transfer, those seem to me to be the big building blocks that need to be um, resolved. Certainly within my party, it's also a very important part of the discussion, um, not as it were simply to see it, if I can put it in those terms, as a constitutional question, um, because that isn't the primary driver from our point of view as a party. The question, as I was putting it at the start, is what is the future that we want to see and why is the union an indispensable part of that? The driver for that is, what is the kind of future we want to see? And I accept it's incumbent on us to make a case for that kind of future and why the union is essential for it. But the sorts of things we've seen in the um, paper that was published last week, the We The People paper, has a sort of set of values attached to that kind of country that we want to see, that kind of state that we want to see, which, is, which goes beyond the purely constitutional, if you like. And I think that's a really important part, certainly for me and the Labour Party, of our contribution to this debate. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask one final question. Um, and it's, 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 it's probably a deeply unfair question, and it's very speculative, so you can bat it back. Um, but um, I mean, given all the strains uh, that the UK is under, and given that you've got a UK government that is pursuing uh, an approach to devolution, which seems to be hell-bent on undermining what's been built up over the last 20 years. You've got um, all the, you know, your strong majority support for independence in Scotland in the recent polling. You've got Northern Ireland that's been essentially left in the EU uh, in, 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 to, all, to all intents and purposes in important economic and regulatory ways. Where do you think the UK is going to be in, in 15 years? It's, it's very hard to reckon, you know, you were talking about a 10-year process, a 20-year process. Will there be a UK at all left in that time for, 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 you, for, for these plans to be relevant to? Well, I was trying to address that really head on in the, in, 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 in the speech, really, because I think it is, you know, really at you know, the heart of the practical application of this debate, isn't it, really? Um, and I do, you know, I do accept there's cl clearly a scenario um, in which Scotland's constitutional, or Scot yes, Scottish government's constitutional ambitions uh, move forward more rapidly than it is possible to develop a sufficiently compelling alternative to the nations of the UK to prevent that from happening. I mean, that, that is obviously a possible scenario and becomes increasingly likely, likely with the passage of time, needless to say. So I think that's why this idea, uh, I'm not recommending, by the way, that you know, a, con a convention takes 20 years. I think the time horizon is significantly shorter than that. Um, you know, very, very much shorter than that. Um, but but I, you know, I'm very open in, in accepting that, that is, it's incumbent, that kind of 
constitutional reform offer which is sufficiently ambitious and has a sufficiently wide base of support needs to be developed rapidly you know because if it doesn't i think the situation that you're describing is the alternative and i would not want to see that i want to see you know a reformed uk but i completely accept that if that isn't something which is developed rapidly and with a significant body of support uh, then there is you know the alternative is pretty clear okay uh Dear Jeremy, I'm going to I'm going to call an end to proceedings there. We we are pretty much at the top of the hour. So can I first of all thank you everybody who's attended, uh, all of you, and we've had a very large number of people um, engaging, and many more will engage with the recording of the session later on. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, and your comments. Sorry, I haven't been able to look in the chat, but I try to ask um, as many of the uh, questions uh, that were put in the question and answer box. I'm uh, really grateful to you, Jeremy, for responding to so many of them. Uh, we've thrown a lot at you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, on behalf of everybody for taking the time this morning, and we'll all be watching the administrative court with great interest to see what happens to the challenge. Diolch o galon, Isi. Diolch o galon, Isi. Diolch o galon, Isi.